Do you like sci-fi and medieval fantasy? Do you like the Tales of game series? Well, boy howdy do I have the game for you. Hi, I'm Ryan Turford from Carpool Gaming, and this is Star Ocean The Divine Force in review. In Star Ocean The Divine Force, you can either play as one of two characters in the game, either the off-world character Raymond Lawrence or the Princess Leticia. When Raymond's transport ship is shot down by mistake by the Pandalactic Federation, his crew ends up crash landing on Aster 4, an underdeveloped planet. Raymond's escape pod lands near Princess Leticia as she's exploring the wilderness with her companion, and the two of them decide to team up to help Ray reunite with his crew, while also Ray helping Leticia on her quest to help stop a war between her kingdom and the Vale Empire. Now, depending on which character you actually select in the game, you'll actually get different cutscenes that'll play throughout the game, and you'll actually go to, you know, differing sections of the game, because there will be uh, a couple chapters in the game where you either play as Leticia and her party or Raymond and his party, and, and depending where you are in the story, sometimes those companions will split up, but a lot of times, usually, Ray usually hands out, hangs out with most of the space characters that you get along the way, and then uh, Leticia hangs out with more of the, the characters from her home planet as well. This also leads to the game giving you different dungeons and bosses and giving you access to different areas to explore um, throughout the game. Um, so it does definitely feel like there are some some big differences between the two of them. I mean, there's also, you know, combat differences between, you know, Ray and Leticia, but you don't really need to. You shouldn't you shouldn't really take that in consideration. I did a little bit not knowing the fact that you could actually just switch to any of your party members um, outside of just Ray and, and Leticia. So if you like, if you're, you're playing as Leticia as the main character, but you want to play as Ray and you like his play style, you can definitely do that. Or you can play as like any of the, the eight other party members that you get, because you get a pretty big party in this game and everyone plays very differently from each other. This also results in different cutscenes and different story bits that you'll absorb. For example, at the beginning of the game, if you pick Ray's story, You'll actually experience through cutscene form, you know, how Ray's ship gets shot down. Whereas if you pick Leticia as your main character, basically the game starts with her and uh, her companion, Albert, kind of walking around. Um, and then they see the, cra the crashing of, you know, Ray's escape pod. Um, and then they just pick up the journey from there. But you actually see all that same information when you play as Ray as the main character. So it's kind of it, it's weird because you're almost missing this like interesting, like, key piece of information at the beginning with the, the setup for the game. Um, so it's, it's interesting that they would omit that um, when you're playing as Leticia. I guess, I guess they're, you know, assuming that you're going to play both paths at some point in Blazing would play through this game twice. Um, and I don't know if there's enough differences between the two playthroughs to warrant that type of thing. It's, it's less of a difference than, you know, playing Jill or versus playing Chris in, in Resident Evil, the original, or, you know, Leon and Claire in Resident Evil 2. Like, it's not that much of a difference. And likewise, also, those are much shorter games, whereas this is like a 25-hour game. It took me about 24 hours for my first playthrough for this game. Um, so it's interesting that they did this, you know, different party dynamic between the two characters or giving you, you know, the two selectable main characters for the game. Overall, though, I actually dug the story for for the Divine Force. I actually liked where the story went with the game, um, especially because there are some moments where it's very medieval fantasy and, you know, very medieval fantasy political stuff. Um, but then the, the space stuff gets introduced much later into the story. And the way that those two kind of ideas kind of meld together is really interesting. Um, and I, I liked where they went with the story overall in this game. So um, I actually think, especially out of the, the RPG stories we had this year, because um, I don't know if this is the strongest year for RPG stories in particular, um, I do think that this is actually one of the stronger ones, if I'm being perfectly honest. Like, I, I liked it more, I enjoyed it more than the story in Soul Hackers or the story in, you know, Valkyrie Elysium. Um, so I did actually like the story that was on display here, but it's not going to, you know, knock your socks off or, you know, do anything that you've never seen before in other stories. Um, but I did like the, 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 the story in this game in particular and enjoyed, you know, learning more about the individual characters and about the planet and, you know, all the space conflict stuff, like all that stuff is just really cool and interesting. However, the one downside that comes along with this is that um, the character, you know, voice acting is OK at best. Like it's, there's some moments of good voice acting in this game, but there's also some moments of 
poor voice acting in this game combined with the fact that the animations for the character models are not great. Like I, I, I actually kind of like the character models. I know in the initial trailer, a lot of people were kind of turned off by them and I, myself included. Um, I wasn't, you know, loving the character designs at first, but as I started playing the game, they, they really grew on me and I actually liked by the end of it, like, you know, looking at the, the, the character models for the characters were, were actually pretty good overall, but the way that they're animated in cutscenes or just some of the line deliveries just made me laugh out loud when it was, when they were not laugh out loud moments or they were not trying to be funny, um, which is just something you don't really love to see in, you know, games that are so heavily based on their stories, like a, you know, 24 hour JRPG like this one. Um, so uh, that is one of the downsides that I have to say with the storytelling itself. Um, but otherwise, again, to my point earlier, I think the story itself beyond all that beyond, with, with those faults in mind, still pretty good. Beyond that, the combat was fast and fluid and just a ton of fun to play. Uh, again, it just really reminded me of a Tales series game. Like if someone, someone in Square Enix has clear, clearly played Tales Horizon and was like, all right, Let's do that. But with Star Ocean, like that's kind of how I felt about the way this game played. Like it was just really fun. Like it was very combo based. You actually in the menus will go in and customize your own combos for each of the characters um, and at, with using abilities that you unlock on the gigantic skill tree that has so many things to unlock. And eventually, like you'll actually get to a point in the game, too, where even though there's so many things to unlock, You'll get to a point around, you know, level 60 or level 70, you'll unlock everything in the skill tree. Um, and you can also level up your abilities with, you know, the, the SP that you earn or skill points that you earn as your characters progress. Um, and you can use those to make the, your abilities stronger as well. Um, and I actually found it a, a tough to find a balance as to when to upgrade those, uh, the, the abilities themselves or when to unlock the stuff from the skill tree. I'm mostly just focused on stuff on the skill tree, especially um, in later, the later half of the game. Um, having like the larger health pool for your characters in particular that you earn from, you know, er, like unlocking the, the health upgrades on the skill tree really, really helped with some of the later encounters. Um, so I really valued the idea of going through the skill tree and kind of making that the focus first and then kind of upgrading the, the abilities kind of secondary. But again, I haven't looked at any guides or anything like that um, because I know some people have probably crunched the numbers on this already to figure out, okay, what's the best way to like optimize the leveling path for this game. Um, but uh, again, I just don't love the, the giant bloat of skills and stuff that you get, especially because there are only so many that you can kind of assign to um, your character combos, which which in a way it's a good thing because then you can experiment with a lot of different ideas or you can customize some of your characters based on encounters. But I was just very lazy and just didn't do a lot of that stuff because ultimately I just didn't really feel like it made a ton of difference, you know, changing up, you know, different combos for different types of boss encounters. And like the Tales of games, again, since this is very combo based, you do have AP points that are set up for whatever character that you're playing as, uh, giving you a limited number of actions that you can take before you have to basically stand still and recharge. If you're actually running around the battlefield, for example, your AP you know, combo points don't actually recharge or recharge very slowly, depending on how far fast you're running. Um, so you really kind of just need to stand in place for a couple seconds to wait for it to, to recharge. And I found it. Early on in the game, it was not like a big deal. And you ha you can actually, using the power of Duma, which is like this um, robotic creature that you find early on in the game that allows you to use certain abilities um, in combat. It allows you to then, um, when you use some of its abilities, it gives you ex additional AP points um, that you can actually use but if you get hit, you actually will lose those. Like you'll lose an AP point um, until you basically go down to five AP points. So if you take a lot of damage in battle, you actually will be much more hindered on how many moves you can do before recharging. And sometimes with some of the later moves, sometimes they take up five AP to use. They're very powerful, mind you. Uh, but so, and, and a lot of but a lot of times on like the later bosses, sometimes the best strategy is to spam those attacks. Um, but you've only really got five AP to use if you've taken any damage or some of the enemies in the game, you can't use the, the, the Duma blindside attack is what it's called um, to earn the extra ability points. So you're kind of just stuck with five ability points. So you're just very slowly killing the enemies and it just, it, it, it slows down combat a lot in a way that, you know, the, the tales of combat when, when they use a similar, you know, combo point system in them, it doesn't feel like the combat is really slowed down or I don't don't ever feel like in those games I'm really hindered by it in the way that I felt kind of handcuffed in some of the, the combat encounters in this game. 
Duma itself also has what's referred to as the VA meter as well, which is this meter that will sometimes fill up in battle depending on what what passive skills you have uh, set up for each of your characters um, and allows you to basically fly around the battlefield at like a really fast pace. Like you can you can basically uh, like fly up and then you it puts up a barrier around the character so you can't be hit. And then you, you know, attack the enemies from the side or from the back to then perform the blind side move on him, which again, I actually liked the incorporation of Duma in combat. And it just, just added that extra, you know, oomph to the combat that, that, that faster pace to then, you know, keep the combat going even when I was low on AP, um, to then, you know, help deal some extra damage and whatnot. So I did really enjoy that aspect of the gameplay. And Duma also works with the open world as well as you're exploring, because you can use Duma to get to, you know, extra heights because you can propel your character in the air, almost like the character, your character is using like a short range jetpack. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, and you'll use that because there, there are some treasure chests in the environment to find um, by using Duma as well as you'll, you'll actually pick up Duma shards along the way along, you know, cursory paths that allows you to then upgrade Duma's skills as well because Duma has some passives associated with it as well. And, and regardless of which character you're using, whatever character you're controlling is the one that's controlling Duma throughout the course of the, the, the combat. So um, if even if you decide to play as the support character that doesn't have any attacks and their combos are basically to buff your allies, um, they still have access to Duma's abilities as well, even, even though they don't really have any attacks of their own. Also, I got to say this about the combat balance. You know, it's one of those games where I never really felt like I had to grind per se, but, you know, I was going into areas where I'm mowing down all of the normal enemies. But then when I get to the boss, the boss like kills my allies in one hit sometimes, or they're just, they just feel like they have these like arbitrarily high life, uh, like health pools where I'm like hitting them for 10 minutes straight until they eventually die. Even though, um, I'm, I'm able to evade all of their attacks. They just die very, very slowly. So I really felt like the level balance was really off where the, the normal enemies were too easy and then the bosses were too difficult. And again, it's not even so much that the bosses were hard to kill or, or I should say like difficult with mechanic wise, but they were just they just had gigantic health pools way higher than you normally would have expected. Um, and then, you know, some some of the later bosses, even if you're like five levels higher than the boss that you're fighting, sometimes they will just one shot you with a normal attack, especially with the computer controlled characters. I noticed this in particular where I'm pretty good at dodging the attacks. But sometimes the computer, you know, your AI companions, um, they'll just stand in the enemy attacks and then the enemies will just kill them on hit. And then you're just spamming revive items on your main character for like half the battle trying to keep them alive. So um, the combat balance is kind of all over the place in this game. But I still like in spite of all this, I still really enjoyed the combat in this game. Again, if you've played a Tales game before, like a modern Tales game and you enjoy the combat there, I think you'll actually enjoy the combat in this game as well. Like I actually kind of like the combat. I, it, I just wish, you know, the leveling balance uh, was a little bit better. Visually as well, you know, beyond the character models, I actually like the environments themselves. The, I love the diversity of environments you go to, whether you're up in the mountains or up, you're in the fields. And of course, since this planet's in space, there's, you know, you'll look in the sky and sometimes there's like multiple planets up there. So you can definitely tell like you're, it feels weird because you're on an alien planet that also, you know, visually looks like you're walking around this fantasy town that just happens to have like three moons up in the sky. So it, it's a little bit weird to it's a little bit of a weird contrast to look at. But I kind of like that. Like it felt unique versus a lot of other fantasy games, fantasy RPGs. Uh, that you'll actually play. So I actually kind of dug the visual aesthetics for this. And like I said, the character models really grew on me. It just, this the animations were a bit stiff on them. And then the last thing I want to touch on as well is the performance of the game. Now, there is it like a 30 FPS locked mode. Um, I didn't play that using that. I played on the, the 60 frames per second performance mode, but it's not a lock 60 because there are some serious frame dips when there's a ton of enemies on screen. Because sometimes you'll actually fight, you know, groups of like, 40 or 50 enemies at a time. Um, and when that happens, sometimes the frame rate goes down to like 10 to 20 frames per second for, you know, a couple seconds. And then it'll just shoot back up to 60 um, as you kind of kill some of the enemies or um, until you kind of get away from a wall. Cause I noticed when your character is kind of up against the wall and there's a lot going on, 
it'll then, you know, slow the, slow the frame rate down. Um, so that is like, a, there are some performance issues with the game. I did play on PlayStation five. Um, so I was playing on next gen hardware. Um, but there is just a little bit of that that you got to watch out for. But for the most part, for like 95% of the experience, I didn't really run into any performance problems, but I just wanted to point out that every once in a while you'd run into this issue where there's just too much stuff on the screen. So overall, what do I think about Star Wars and the Divine Force? So you, you can definitely tell my opinions are a little bit mixed on this game. On one hand, I really like a lot about it. I like the story. I like the characters. I like the combat for the most part. Again, like each of those things has, you know, nit, little nitpicks here and there. But for the most part, I actually enjoyed this a lot. In fact, when I go back and compare it to other Star Ocean games in the series, honestly, I think this is one of the better ones. In fact, I think, you know, it's probably my third favorite Star Ocean game behind the first two from PlayStation 1. Like, that's like that's kind of the hierarchy, because I think the first two games on PlayStation 1 are, are still really special and still great to play today, especially Second Story. Like, that game is still really, really good to today like even to go back to the playstation one version it's great it's too bad we didn't get the the north Amer the the remake of two in north america because i think that game would have been awesome to get um but we did you know get the remake of you know the the first departure and that was really good too um so yeah i i, I think this is probably third in the hierarchy it's definitely like the best star modern star ocean game i think so even though i do have a lot of nitpicks and even though i have mixed feelings i still really like this game a lot it's definitely not, you know, my favorite RPG of the year or anything like that. And likewise, you know, you know, especially at the time I'm recording this review, you know, Black Friday is this week um, and I've already seen this game going on sale this week. I definitely think that this is the type of game you probably pick up on sale or play on on a Game Pass or PlayStation Plus, you know, if the game eventually comes to one of those services. Um, but I do think, you know, when you get around to playing this, you'll have a good time. Um, just like I did, I think that there is a lot to like about this game, and I definitely think it's worth playing. And if you're interested in learning more or learning if this game is for you or if you're sure you should be playing this game, there is a demo available on PlayStation 4 or and 5 and on Xbox Series consoles, um, which allows you to carry your progress over to the main game um, once you finish it. But it does lock you into the choice of playing as Ray, so just keep that in mind. Um, if you decide to go the demo route, but the demos are good, really good indication because I think if you like the demo, I think you're going to like the overall game. Well, anyways, that's going to do it for my review of Star Ocean, the Divine Force. What do you think about the Star Ocean series or just the Divine Force in general? Are you playing it? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. And likewise, if you have any questions about anything that I didn't answer in this review, again, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. As for me, you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Turford. You can find us on Twitter at Carpool Gaming on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Carpool Gaming on podcast services around the globe. Until then, friends, I'm Ryan Turford. This has been my review of Star Ocean, The Divine Force, and I'm out. We have come to cocky. Get the jump. Warning. Two levels. Now to the